is ready? Okay, good. Okay, morning colleagues, thanks for coming out Sunday morning. Um, we, not, we wouldn't necessarily have a press conference or media briefing every Sunday morning, but once there are current issues to address, Sunday morning is usually a relatively quiet time for us and hopefully a quiet time for you as well. So thanks for coming out on this Sunday morning. Last week, Sunday, we addressed in our MSJ media conference a number of issues. The matter of the president's housing allowance of $28,000 tax-free, which is still very much in the public domain. And we certainly feel um, very certain in our position that it was inappropriate for the president to be in receipt of this $28,000 tax-free housing allowance. This matter, as we said before, ought to have been resolved before um, the president was sworn in um, as the president of the republic and addressed as part of the arrangements that were to be put into effect um, for him, given the fact that the president's house is still not available for his accommodation. So we reiterate that it is inappropriate for President Carmona to be in receipt of $28,000 tax-free housing allowance. We also identified last week um, the issue of industrial relations and stated that the state enterprises and the government have engaged in the worst industrial relations practices ever, um, certainly of our government. And um, our position, as stated last week, has been vindicated by the decision of the industrial court earlier this week, or rather, well, we're now into a new week, so I suppose last week, the position of the, the industrial court to uh, find that the 68 workers who were dismissed by state-owned National Petroleum just over a year ago, that that dismissal was wrong, harsh, oppressive, and so on. All the workers have been ordered back on their job by the industrial court, reinstated without any loss of benefits, including um, full salary and so on, and awarded damages in the amount of $40,000 each. Um, that is a very clear, strong, evidentiary statement in support of the point that we made last week that this government has engaged in the worst industrial relations practices ever because this is a state enterprise NP that we are dealing with. Um, and it would be horrendous indeed and an act of pure spite, wickedness, and vindictiveness if NP, either on its own or on instructions from any line minister, if NP was to decide to appeal the industrial court's judgment. So I just wanted to identify some continuity in what we said last week and that what we have been saying um, is borne out by the facts consistently. Um, similarly, last week, we, in response to a question from one of your colleagues, um, spoke to the issue of, of flooding and the problems particularly along the eastern and northeastern coasts of the of, and communities in those areas of the island. And what we said last week was that the government response was slow and was seemed to be somewhat uncoordinated, but certainly was slow. And that given the fact that significant flooding had happened within 24 to 36 hours of the rains first falling, and that more rains at that time had been forecast to fall for several days, that there needed to be a massive immediate intervention in those communities. Um, that didn't happen, and again, we made the point that the, the government is very slow, has been very slow in responding to the flooding matter. And you had confirmation of our position coming from the government where the Minister of Works himself said that the situation um, is worse than at first they thought. Well, that is an unacceptable statement by the minister. Um, Trinidad is not a continent, a very small island. Everybody knew what was happening. There were photographs being posted up on Facebook, on Facebook and, and video clips on YouTube and so on, long before the minister made his statement that flooding was worse than at first thought. So 
we, we want to reiterate our position that this government has been very tardy in dealing with the problems and is very reactive and, and, and quite clearly does not have a proper disaster management plan in place. Um, and, and the experience of the residents and communities affected by flooding over the last, well, pre the previous 10 days or so can certainly attest to that. I want to now move from those issues, and of course we dealt with the highway route matter we had with us last week, Sunday, Mr. Vishal Budai, who is a member of the HRM, and he spoke to the problems of the collapsing sections of the new highway um, and other matters related to the Debe to um, Mondezir section of the highway. I had, in fact, seen the information and did not walk with it last week Sunday about the contractor OES, where senior OES executives in Brazil um, had been arrested just a few days prior to our media conference last Sunday, had been arrested on allegations of corruption and so on. Very, very senior OES officials, including the president, vice presidents of various divisions and so on of that company. As we know, OES is the contractor in, involved in the construction of both the Debe to Mondezir Highway as well as the San Fernando to Point Fourteen Highway. And it, this is the largest single investment um, contract in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it's 10 times as large in dollar terms as the Piaco airport contract and therefore major issues of governance have arisen with respect to this highway project. With the arrest of persons in Brazil who are senior executive officers of OES, it raises once again the issue here in Trinidad and Tobago about the contract um, which has never been made public, um, the contract between NITCO and the government of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, sorry, and OES, um, which contract has never been made public. It raises issues about the size of the contract. It raises issues about the efficacy of the work being done by OES. Um, it raises issues about the design, build, nature of the of the contract. In other words, what is happening is that the contractor is being told to design and build as he goes along and so on, rather than have a properly designed project before, which project is tendered for with known quantities and therefore known expenditure and fixed expenditure and so on. All the issues surrounding this project come to the fore when principals of this company OES have been arrested in Brazil. There was also, and I'm sure the media can research it, there was also a situation involving OES in one of the Central American countries where a contract with OES and the government was cancelled because of questionable um, financial and other arrangements um, and suggestions or allegations of corruption. We think, therefore, that this OES issue um, ought to force the government to put a hold on the section between Pinal and Mondesir, because of some work has already happened between Debe and Pinal, and no further work between Debe and Pinal, um, while the whole issue of the contract itself is interrogated, the issue of alternative options for connectivity in the area which could come in at a lower cost, as for example proposed by the HRM, that those are interrogated and investigated. And until we get a full response from the JCC um, to what NITCO has said, it claims to have done to implement the Armstrong Committee's recommendations. In other words, all of these issues that are coming up are further reasons why the government ought to um, put a pause on further work, um, continue the work between 
point fourteen and San Fernando, but put a pause on the other work until all um, of these issues can be satisfactorily addressed with the involvement of independent persons so that citizens can feel comfortable that $7.2 billion plus of taxpayers' money, direct taxpayers' money, um, is being spent in a proper manner. Um, and so we think there are many issues that are going to come out of an independent investigation of the contract itself, the design bill nature of that contract, the issue of Mondezir to Debe, and whether that is the best way of dealing with the traffic problems, and all of the recommendations of the Armstrong report. And that issue of OES leads us to the entire more general question of public procurement in Trinidad and Tobago. When the partnership put together its manifesto, it included in that, in 2010, a commitment to address public procurement legislation as a matter of urgency. In fact, the manifesto spoke to legislation being tabled within 90 days. But legislation was not tabled. What was tabled was um, a, a, a parliamentary document which included um, two draft pieces of legislation. One was the white paper, white paper on public procurement that had been prepared under the Manning government, which the Manning government, PNM government, had committed to implement and therefore and then reneged and never implemented it. And the second uh, document that was tabled in the parliament at that time was a previous, previously drafted bill that would have seen the repeal and replacement of the Central Tenders Board. Those two legislative proposals were tabled and a Joint Select Committee of Parliament was established. Um, that Joint Select Committee reported within one year of it being appointed and the work of the committee was saved in accordance with parliamentary procedure and then a, it, a second committee uh, was set up in the second year of the Parliament and continued that work and brought a report to the Parliament. I myself was a member of those two committees. But no legislation was tabled by the committee, which was, in my own view, an error and a mistake by the committee, but no legislation was tabled. Subsequently, legislation was tabled coming from the government, and that legislation was debated, debated um, and passed in the Senate. It then did not make it to the House before Parliament was prorogued in, um, a few months ago, and is now before the House of Representatives, but seems to be taking its own good time through the House, as distinct from other legislation like the amendment um, to the Constitution to provide for runoff and so on, which uh, debate took place over several consecutive days, late into the night and early into the morning, in, because the government had a desire to get that legislation passed urgently. But when it comes to public procurement, they're taking a very leisurely approach to the debate and passage of this legislation. We want to say categorically that we, the MSJ has always stand, stood for, and we continue to stand for, very strong public procurement legislation, legislation that will cover every single cent of public money. And what do we mean by public money? Public money is all the money that is expended upon the basis of revenues earned by the government, taxes earned by the government, or not earned, but taxes received by the government, which are paid for by individual taxpayers, whether you pay individual income tax, whether you pay value-added tax, whether you pay corporation tax, any other forms of taxes like import duties, um, licenses, things where you uh, get a driver's permit, all of that revenue is public money. So citizens in a variety of ways contribute towards public money, health surcharge, all of that which goes into 
the consolidated fund is public money. But in addition to that, there are other sources of public money which must be regulated by public procurement. For example, the government also receives dividends from state corporations that are profitable. In some cases, like in the last few years, NGC has been contributing seven, eight billion dollars a year just in, in, in profits to that state, from that state company to the government. So all of the profits from state companies are also public money. And then state-owned companies, whether partially owned or completely owned, they also spend public money because being state enterprises, they're really owned by all taxpayers, by the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, and managed in trust on our behalf by, by the government or by boards appointed by the government, as the case would be. So all public enterprises, state enterprises, statutory bodies, statutory boards, institutions like the UTT, all of those are engaged in the expenditure of public money. Public money is the largest single pool of resources in Trinidad and Tobago which is expended. If you include government's annual budget of, what, over $50 billion a year, um, and, and therefore government expenditure based upon borrowing, when, you, when the government borrows, that also becomes public money because we as taxpayers have to repay it. So that borrowings also becomes public money. State enterprise sector, we're talking about multi-billion dollar state enterprises, Tech, WASA, Petrotrin, NGC, other state enterprises and so on. Multi-multi-billion dollar um, state sector. We are talking about a very significant part of the country's um, gross domestic product, the GDP. And therefore, all of that public money must be regulated by public procurement legislation. And we want to say that um, we must have in that public procurement legislation every single cent that a government expends ought to be covered by that procurement legislation. We also want to say that that legislation needs to have in it a strong regulator, not only someone that would set the tender rules for all procurement and also for the disposal of assets because when the government sells assets or leases assets, whether it is um, which a position we disagree with, lease out and farm out in the oil industry, whether they give Invaders Bay to um, the owners of Movie Town for a project, all of that um, ought to be covered by public procurement legislation because um, we have examples of horrendous giveaways of land right now. Former Karini land, former um, Palosico Agricultural Enterprise Limited land, which was Petrotrain's land, Two largest landowners were Karani or R. Karani, um, and which land went into the EMBDC, and also Petrotrin land, which went to PSAEL. Huge tracts of land. We don't know how that land is being disposed of. Disposal of land must also be covered by public procurement. And therefore, we want strong regulator not only to set the rules that would govern disposal of assets or the procurement of contracts for goods and services or for investment, capital investment projects like the highway and, and construction of schools and so on. But that regulator must also have power to investigate wrongdoing, including seizing documents um, and, and raiding offices and so on and getting evidence. Of course, the actual prosecution will have to be done through other means because you cannot investigate and prosecute and, and find guilty under the same body. But certainly, strong, powerful investigative powers must be accorded to that regulator. We are very, very concerned, therefore, about corruption in Trinidad and Tobago. I've always been. That was one of the reasons why we left the partnership. The very last meeting I attended of political leaders of the partnership, I raised with the leaders the issue of corruption. And the Prime Minister asked me at the time whether the corruption was only at the level of state boards or whether it was 
also at the level of cabinet, and I said to her, Prime Minister, both. And she said, she too has heard that. The other leaders concurred with what I raised, but her response was that she couldn't do anything about it. Well, we are saying today, as I've said before, but to repeat it, that you cannot have 40 thieves without an Alibaba. Can't have 40 thieves without an Alibaba. You cannot have corruption taking place in the government, in state sector, and then want to blame other persons, other ministers, other officials in the context of collective cabinet responsibility where the prime minister is the head of the cabinet, the prime minister must take responsibility for wrongdoing by her ministers um, and by, by state boards and so on. It cannot be that she washes her hands like Pontius Pilate of wrongdoing by persons that she chose or appointed as ministers or as heads of state boards and so on. And therefore, the buck stops with her on this issue of corruption. Um, and as I said, you can't have 40 thieves without an Ali Baba. And therefore, the issue of public procurement, the issue of the QEP interchange, we have, we continue to have concerns about that QEP um, interchange. Um, it is a situation where um, whichever is the contractor, we're not, bit, we're not batting now for contractor A, B, or C, but whichever contractor is chosen, given the nature of that interchange and having to do work on constructing an interchange at the same time that major traffic is flowing east, west, north, and south, and of course the variations thereof with traffic moving from east to north, east to south, west to north, west to south, um, north to east, north to west, south to east, south to west, all of those permutations arise at the QEP interchange. You therefore need a contractor that has the experience and capacity to build an interchange with the least amount of inconvenience and um, difficulty with traffic flow. Um, and, and that is a critical, critical factor. We don't want a contractor that has no experience and can't do the work, or when it does the work, it does that work to a poor standard. Um, that would be horrendous. So we are concerned about the award of that contract. I want to um, identify that whether Ms. Ruth Narine's initial concerns were correct or not, we don't have the evidence, but the very fact that she raised it ought to be a major red flag um, identified. And the Prime Minister seemed to have fobbed it off by asking the Minister to, to, to investigate the matter. You can't ask himself to investigate himself. Um, the Prime Minister did that in the prison gate matter with asking the Attorney General to investigate a complaint that was really made against the Attorney General himself. Um, similarly with the email gate matter and so on. And that is absolutely wrong. So we are saying that um, the country needs to know, we're talking about anywhere between 300 and odd and over $500 million of taxpayers' money, public money to be spent on that interchange. We need to know that there has been a proper process of procurement for this project and that um, a competent contractor has been hired or will be hired to engage in this construction. That then takes me to the last point we want to make, and all of these are interrelated as you recognize. I'm taking a little time to draw the connections between one and the other because they're all interconnected. Um, and that is the issue of local content. The local content chamber had a forum um, on Monday, Monday of, of last week. Um, originally, they had, it was supposed to be a two-day forum, and they had asked MSJ to do a presentation together with the other political parties on what our policy is on local content. The other parties apparently didn't really respond, so, um, and some other presenters were unable to attend, so the conference became a one-day conference. But simply to say that MSJ has a very strong policy position on local content. 
from the area of culture, where we advocate, for example, 50% of all that we hear and see on electronic media ought to be local content, to that of local content in the energy sector along the, the energy value chain from natural gas to, 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 to de or regasification, terminaling in other countries where we export our LNG all along the value chain. We ought to have strong local content and so on in the um, ability of firms to provide goods and services and technology in the energy sector through to construction. Um, we, all of the important sectors in tourism, if we want to build a strong tourism sector, it makes no sense to then import, I'm not saying this is a fact, but just to suggest, makes no sense then to import 90% of the food that you serve in a hotel. Um, that, that makes a nonsense of tourism. It simply means that the foreign exchange that you earn goes back out again to pay for the food and the other items that are consumed in, in a hotel. Where tourism makes sense is where 90% of what is consumed within the hotel is produced locally and therefore creates, as the economists would say, linkages uh, between one sector going backwards to your agricultural and food processing and service sector and so on and so on. So we are very strong in our position for local content and we support the local content chamber. We support the local content chamber in their call for the use of local providers of goods and services. Um, and we say that, of course, in the context of a local provider, local um, contractor and so on, being competent and capable. We're not now advocating lowering of standards for, for locals. We are advocating best practice, best standards and so on, but we also say that there are many local contractors who meet best practice um, and, and best standards. And we cannot develop our economy unless we ensure that